I've got a couple of multi-snow examples here that show how the push-pull amp works. And we'll start with a, a common collector amplifier. This is used in the NPN transistor. And I've actually reused the values that I did in the, in the explanation in the previous video. So this is 10K, this is 820, got 10 volts coming in here. This point should normally be sitting at 0.7 volts, maybe a little bit more. And then coming out of here, when I have no signal coming in, if this is a DC meter, this should be sitting at zero. So let's turn on the simulation tools here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down the amplitude of the input voltage. I'm going to turn it down to like a pico volt, which is essentially a zero volt signal. And if I reduce the input down to zero, then I can measure the DC value. So I'll pop this meter open and I've got this meter on volts DC. So I can see that there's about 754 millivolts right here, which is pretty much exactly what we calculated. And then after the diode drop DC wise here, I've got about 108 millivolts that's actually appearing across my 200 ohm load. We could figure that current out, but I'd say 0.1 volts over 200 ohms is going to be pretty small current. So now when I bring the signal up, so the DC bias is that there's really not much voltage across this 200 ohm load. And now I can bring back the input voltage. And so now I, I'm applying a sine wave onto the input. And you can see that when the positive of the sine wave goes up, so here the, the positive of the sine wave goes up. This is when I see an output across the load. But when I go on a negative input, I get pretty much a flat line out of it. So we've biased the CC amp on the edge of conduction. And when we put in a, a positive pulse, we get an output. So it's only conducting for half the cycle. Now let's bring in the other kind of transistor. So now I've added in the other kind of transistor, the PNP, and I basically duplicated the circuit. I flipped it over and duplicated it down here. Uh, I haven't joined them at the middle yet, but now if I turn this on, so here I've got this meter going here. So the base voltage of the Q1 is sitting at about 750 millivolts, and the base voltage of Q2 here so this transistor is sitting at about minus 0.75 volts, and this one's sitting at about plus 0.75. So they're both turned on a little bit. Here's oscilloscope one, and that's measuring this output. So they are separated. I've got the output separated at the moment. So V out one here is basically only the positive pulses. That comes from the push transistor, which will basically, when I turn this guy on, it will connect this load to 10 volts, so so it's an, it push pulls it, it pushes it up, so you can see the positive spikes, and then when I click on this one here, so now I'm looking at the voltage across at this point here, and here you can see it's the negative spikes. So I got two CC amps, they're independent of each other right now, and each one is conducting for half of the input sine wave. Let's join those guys together now. Those ground points in the middle. Let's join those together. And now we can measure the output swing. And here you can see this is what's going in. And this is what's coming out. So now that I've joined the two outputs together, in the previous example, each transistor did half. Well, if I tie the two halves together, I tie the two transistor emitters together, now I've got a circuit that puts out a full sine wave. They're both on the same scale here, one volt, uh, one volt per division. So you can see that there's no gain. It's a common collector amplifier, so gain is about one. Uh, there's no significant gain increase on this. Now, one of the things about this one at this point, though, is I'm going to point out that uh, the current, so the current down through here, this is the DC current, is about 7.7. .7, let's say it's about 8 milli, milliamps here. 
That could be a bit of a problem because this transistor here, if this is 10 on this side, if I crank this input down to a picovolt, so now it's a picovolt, you can see that there's nothing coming out. So I'm putting in no signal and the voltage that's appearing across the load is pretty much zero volts, 35 millivolts. So with no signal in, I've actually got 7.4 milliamps going from plus 10 to minus 10. And these guys each have about 10 volts across them. So that works out to about 70 milliwatts each. This can sometimes be a problem with uh, bipolar junction transistors because if they heat up, their beta will increase with temperature and then they'll actually conduct more milliamps. And if you get more milliamps, now you get more heat generated and you get a higher temperature and it conducts more. This is called thermal runaway. And it's a really bad thing because basically the transistors, the change in temperature reinforces the change in temperature. So it's a positive feedback system that can end up with these guys burning themselves out. So when you bias these, you kind of really want to watch this uh, trickle current from the 10 volt down to the minus 10 when there's no signal in. So I'm going to try and minimize that. So here I've gone to, instead of 820 ohm resistors, you can see right here it's 820. In the next circuit, I've changed those out to 680. So this will bring the base voltages down even more. So let me run this one. So now instead of 0.75 volts on the base, it's about 600, 650 millivolts. If I crank the signal down, the incoming signal down to that picovolt range, you can see that now that the trickle current with no signal coming in, it's hundreds of microamps. So this is pretty much off, and this would be dissipating very little power in these transistors. So when you bias these things, you kind of want to tune them a little bit so you get no real substantial current when you don't have a signal. Now, if I go back to a volt here, if you go too far, I'm kind of looking over here at the sine wave thing, and I'm not sure that that's a, a great waveform. Let me crank that up a little bit. And let me move this out a little bit. You see that little hump here? It's not quite so smooth right at this point here. I'm not sure that you can see that but it's not super smooth right in the middle of this. There's a little bit of distortion here. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, so 680 and 680 might not be high enough because I, I wanna try and get maybe 0.65 or 0.7 volts on the base in order to turn it on a little bit more and that'll get rid of that distortion. But let's take a look at where that distortion really comes from. So now I've replaced the two 680s with a 1K and a 500 ohm where I can dial in what resistance I want. So let's see what happens when I modify this resistance. So here that looks like a pretty good sine wave. But if I play with that resistor value... This was working nice before. Let me just stop this for a second. Let's change this to 800 ohms. Take it down a little bit more. Okay, so I've taken it down a little bit more, maybe a little too much. So here you can see that I'm playing with this resistor. And when I go down, okay, there's a problem. There's a problem with the simulation here. I've got to restart it to do this. So let me crank this back up to 1K. I don't want to stop because uh, 
takes a while to go through these. Okay, so here we go. So here you can see it's a good sine wave. When I'm putting about 1500 ohms across there. But if I take this down a little bit, if I take this down to the middle, turn this off, come back on, you can see that there's a little bit of distortion starts to appear here in the crossover point. What's happening is I'm going too low on the base voltages, and so the transistors are, are, are off, essentially. They're totally out of, like, they're not on the edge of cut off. I've reduced the base voltage to the point that the input signal actually has to go up a little bit before I get any output. And if I turn it down even a little bit more, this little dead spot in the middle gets worse. And what this dead spot represents is basically what's happening here is in this time period here, this upper transistor is on and it's putting, it's pulling the output up. This one here in the low areas here, that's where this transistor is on and it's pulling it down. In between there, so in this range here, what happens is both transistors are off and so I get like a dead spot in the output. This is called crossover distortion and it's due to improper biasing and I need to increase this resistance because I want to get 0.7 volts on this base on this one and then it'll be ready to conduct. So the next question might be, well, if, if the goal is to just get 0.7 volts on the base of the transistors, couldn't we just replace those with a diode? And the answer to that is yes. If I can just take those resistors out, I've been using resistors just so that you get the idea of what we're trying to do with, with getting the base voltages up to plus minus 0.7 but you can actually take those resistors out and then you can replace them with diodes. Now, when you do that, you'll notice here that I've only got one capacitor coming into the center of the diodes. That's because we model these diodes, the, we think of them in their DC value, which is 0.7 volts. But if we think of the AC equivalent circuit, these guys will be shorted. So we can bring this capacitor into the middle while with the resistors, with the resistors, we had to take a capacitor to each base because this resistance, we couldn't go into the middle of that because then we'd lose some of the signal through the resistances. We want to apply the signal directly to the base of both of them. If we use diodes in the AC model, we are connecting the signal directly to the base of both of them. So put a couple diodes in there and then we turn this one on. And here you can see it's uh, 2.59 milliamps. So there's a fair bit of current going down here, but you can still see a little bit of distortion in here. So this is, it's better because we don't have to do any adjustments and it comes up close, but it's still not working perfectly. And the reason it's not working perfectly is that these transistors, these 1N914s, don't have exactly the same characteristics as the transistors and the diodes and the transistors. So how can we fix that? Well, if we're doing an integrated circuit, the transistors are kind of free if we're putting this on a, a small chip. So why don't we just use another 3904 and another 3906? So now this diode here, it's gonna have the same characteristics as this diode, and this should bias properly. So let me turn this one on. And there you go, now you can see it's pretty much uh, a smooth line over here in the middle. There's no more crossover dis distortion. That's because the voltage drop that these guys create, because it's the same type of transistor, the voltage drop created matches what's required to turn this on perfectly because it's the same kind of transistor. Um, so what you can do, I've added a couple other little things in here. So in the lab, you're supposed to measure Z out. Well, if you put in like a switch, what you can do is you can measure the voltage. Let me turn this one on. So right now, 
I'm putting in one volt, which is giving me 700 millivolts RMS voltage out of this. And when I close the switch and load it down, it drops to 696 millivolts. Using those two values, you can calculate what the Z out of the circuit is. And see it just drop just a little bit. Okay, so that's hopefully you've kind of got the idea on how a push pull works conceptually. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to calculate Z in, Z out, and AV.